here it's also published uh, by Brooks Oak. Uh, so then, yeah, we'll have um, uh, some time for, for questions, um, and then we'll uh, just sum up. So. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and thanks, everybody, for making it out here to Putney. Um, possibly harder today than it was in 1647, but still <laughs> quite a schlep. Uh, and my thanks, obviously, to St. Mary's uh, Putney for for hosting us and uh, Sandra who did all the organisation for the meeting and uh, um, if you've got some time afterwards um, over there in the main part of the church there's what I suppose could only rightly be called a small shrine uh, to the to the lepers with some historical material displayed there and you can have a look at the, the famous quote from Thomas Rainsborough which I'll come to in the course of this talk but which is engraved in the uh, balcony of the, of the church of the church here. So um, I think it's a good moment to be discussing this. Um, at when they met in Putney Church in 1647, there was a Charles on the throne, just. <laughs> and there is just a Charles on the throne now. So it's worth probably recalling um, how they dealt with their Charles and uh, new ideas about how we deal with ours. Um, I don't have a remote control, so I'm going to have to rely on um, my charming sister to be able to do this. So let's talk about where the Levellers, uh, who were the most uh, organised radical group in the English Revolution of the 1640s, um, where, they, where they came from. And um, there are kind of three sort of constituencies that, the, um, that they emerged out of. Um, the first uh, was London and its apprentices. Um, the apprentices of London, you, uh, if you, were, you had to be fairly well off to do this. Um, but uh, you could enter into trade, you would spend five to seven years in the household of a master, living in the master's house, learning your trade, and then you would become uh, a free man of the city, a free man of one of the livery companies, of the watchmakers or the leather sellers company, the great city corporations, if you successfully completed your apprentice. Now, the local apprentices in um, 1640 uh, were the single biggest group of young people who were in any form of higher education until higher education in this country was opened up in the 1950s and 1960s. So there were a lot of them crammed into what was a, a, a massive and growing uh, metropolis, both within the city walls and along the banks of the Thames out towards Wapping and on the south side of what was the only bridge over the Thames uh, London Bridge in, uh, in uh, Southwark. Um, some, but not all, <coughs> of the apprentices would have been radicals in religion. Um, so um, the church, uh, and I think this is quite important to sort of have in your mind when we're discussing uh, the English Revolution and the sort of position of, uh, of religion within it. Um, the Church of England was the national church. And it was compulsory that you were a member of it. If you did not attend parish services or did not have your children baptised in the Church of England, you could be hauled before a court and ultimately fined or even jailed uh, for non-compliance. Any views about Christianity or any other religion by extension that were outside the National Church were essentially illegal and outlawed, uh, outlawed views, including the kind of radical Puritanism um, which many of the, or some of the apprentices were involved in. And this pamphlet, this contemporary pamphlet from 1641, which is describing a swarm of sectaries and schismatics, which was how people who wanted to worship outside and independently of the Church of England would be described. Uh, and you can see that they weren't held in particularly high esteem by the writer of this pamphlet, wherein is discovered the strange preaching or prating of such are, by their trades, cobblers, tinkers, peddlers, weavers, sow gelders, and chimney sweeps. Now, this is written by the notorious royalist Waterman, uh, John Taylor, the so-called water poet. And if you come down to Putney, I guess, he or one of his uh, accomplices would have been the person that brought you down the Thames uh, to Putney uh, in those days. Um, the final bit of the origin of the levellers is uh, in illegal printing. Uh, they were involved um, even before the revolution, but in the early years of the revolution, as soon as it started, 
in the business of producing illegal, uh, illegal pamphlets on illegal presses hidden uh, within uh, London. If you didn't, this was in the 17th century England, with a licensed press. If you didn't have a government license to print, you were printing illegally. The Stationers Company, which was the city uh, corporation which had a monopoly on licensed printing, would send its agents to hunt you down, smash your press, and have you, uh, and have you uh, arrested. If you want to move on, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about this. Um, so this is, um, I'm going to show you now, uh, if you want to start it playing, it should be, that'd be great. Um, this is the closest you're going to get to uh, um, understanding what London looked like um, in the mid-17th century. And it's a fantastic piece of work um, done by students at uh, De Montfort University in Leicester. And what they did is they consulted all the architectural drawings and the uh, building plans and the surviving buildings, and then they used gaming technology to create a virtual London of mm -hmm. the uh, of the 17th century. And although this for some reason the projection is a little fuzzy, um, <laughs> you can you can go and see this the whole this online. But this takes you through uh, the alleyways uh, and uh, and streets of London down to the down to the river, the main artery, the main uh, the main conduit for movement of people and goods. Um, in, in London. And here you get some sense of the incredibly densely packed nature of London, the sheer number of parish churches, practically one on every corner. Um, same would have been true of taverns, by the way. Um, and, uh, and this is important, the geographical uh, kind of um, compactness of London, the fact that it's been growing rapidly over the last 50 years, that it was spilling out into the so-called Tower Hamlets, the hamlets that were by the side of the Tower of London in the east and across in Southwark, where a lot of the sort of smellier and more unpleasant uh, industries as well as the playhouses um, were based because that was outside the jurisdiction or partially outside the jurisdiction of both the Bishops of London and the Corporation of London who controlled the area with inside the, uh, the walled, uh, the walled uh, city. It's important because news went really quickly down these alleyways. Um, it was said in one of the early demonstrations outside Westminster that Captain John Benn, who was one of the key activists in the City of London, mobilising support for Parliament, could send a message to the City of London and bring a crowd of apprentices down to join the demonstration while it was taking place in real time. They would pour out of Ludgate and Newgate and down uh, the Strand uh, to, uh, to um, Westminster. Um, so there's more of this, but if we just click on it again. Uh. <laughs> so here's um, the best-known leveller, the leader of the levellers, uh, John Lilton. Um, this is um, his signature on a document from June 1646 that's in the, um, the House of Lords Records uh, Library. And uh, I guess what I want to draw attention to here is this. This is the Lilburn family seal. Um, what this tells you is that John Lilburn came from a gentry uh, family. He was uh, a second son, uh, apprenticed into, uh, into trade uh, with the mercer, uh, Thomas Hewson, on what is now Cannon Street, then was known as London, as London Stone. Um, that's where he spent his apprenticeship. He uh, was uh, a part of that subculture, if you like, of London, of London apprentices. Uh, second sons, by the way, if you, if you were, you know, because of primogeniture, if you were a second son, you didn't inherit. So John Lilburn wasn't about to inherit any land uh, or wealth from his family, and that's why second sons got apprenticed into, into trade. And second sons in the 17th century was a phrase, a contemporary phrase, which carried something of the kind of weight that um, angry young men carried <laughs> in 1950s Britain. These were people who felt displaced, who were moving from a gentry environment in, in, in Lilburn's case in, uh, in, uh, in County Durham, uh, down into the uh, urban environment of, uh, of London where they were uh, e experiencing a completely different, I mean far, far different contrast between uh, town and country, certainly London and country, uh, then than it is now, and uh, beginning to, as he did, encounter some radical 
uh, religious uh, religious thinkers. If we click on a bit, that'd be great. And this is what happened to you if you were moving, or could happen to you if you were moving in those uh, radical uh, religious um, circles. This is not contemporary print; it's a it's a later it's a later print. But what it depicts is the punishment of John Lilburn in the late 1630s because he was helping to illegally import radical religious material from Holland. Holland was the only republic in the world. It was a Protestant republic. A lot of uh, radical English exiles were, were there, and you could have printed and import into this country material, which was much more difficult to print and was illegal in any case. He was given away um, by one of his compatriots, arrested uh, and taken uh, before the Court of Star Chamber. The Court of Star Chamber was what was called a prerogative court. It, uh, it was a no jury court. It sat, uh, prerogative means it sat at the pleasure of, uh, of the monarch, and the main way of convicting somebody in Star Chamber was by confession. You forced them one way or another to admit to a crime, and then they were uh, and then they were sentenced. This is exactly what happened to Lilburn, um, but because it was a prerogative court, he refused to testify before it, and uh, because he refused to testify before it, he became known to the London crowd from that moment on as either freeborn uh, John Lilburn or honest John Lilburn. Freeborn because he said no freeborn Englishman should be forced to testify before a prerogative court. And for saying that, um, he was taken from his cell in the Fleet Prison, which is where Fleet Street is now, um, and tied, as he put it, to the arse end of a cart and dragged all the way down to Westminster Yard and every step of the way he was flogged with a three-thonged um, knotted leather whip until, as one of the substantial crowd that were watching him said, his shoulders swelled to the size of penny loaves. Um, when he got to um, Westminster Yard, he was put in the uh, stocks, and he was still throwing from his coat pockets the illegal pamphlets uh, that he uh, imported, as he was in the stocks and making speeches uh, to the crowd, uh, the jailer got so fed up with him that he gagged him to stop him speaking any further, and he then stamped his feet in protest for the remaining uh, two hours of the punishment. Now, Lilburn wasn't the only person to which this was happening. Actually, he wasn't the main person, the so-called Puritan martyrs, of whom he was a kind of understudy. Um, uh, Burton, Bastard, and Payne had had even more uh, severe, uh, severe punishments. Um, for instance, uh, they had a, a Prince case, William Prince case, that had his ears sliced off, and the letters S L for seditious libeler branded on uh, to his face. So, um, we we'll move on a little bit here. Um, this is a response to that punishment. Um, so this is a pamphlet issued just as the English Revolution is breaking out in 16, uh, 1641, just as for the first time, uh, Charles I, uh, for the first time in 11 years, um, Charles has governed without a parliament for 11 years, the so-called personal rule, and he's been forced uh, to call a parliament, and this pamphlet is issued at that time, and it's an account of, um, the, well, as it says, the Christian man's trial the trials of John Lilburn, and this is a, an engraving by George Glover uh, of Lilburn in his early, in his early 20s at that, uh, at that time. What's interesting about it is not just that this is out, I mean this again would have been illegal, but it's now being uh, produced uh, in, uh, in London by this man, printed for William Larner. Now Larner was a mainstay of level of printing from this day right way forward to producing bigger pamphlets in the in the 1650s. And what this tells you is that John Lilburn was already in the business of organised politics. Because to write a pamphlet is an individual act. To be able to trust somebody else to illegally print it, and you're obviously involved in the printing, there's a later description, I think actually if I remember rightly, by Lana, or, or meant by, no, no, by Samuel Chidley, who became Chidley or became the 
treasurable letters. You say, um, that Milbury used to get incredibly angry reading the proofs of his pamphlets because the printers would insert foreign matter um, into them and Milbury was out and striking it out on the, on the proofs. So you're engaged in the very collective business of illegal printing where a high degree of organisational trust is necessary and once it's printed you have to have people like um, later arrested uh, Rebecca Brown, um, the daughter of a, print, of a stationer called William Brown, who was caught distributing illegal uh, Lilburn pamphlets. So you had to have a network of trusted colleagues who would print it, and you had to have a network of colleagues who you knew and could be trusted who would distribute it without giving you away if they were caught by the stationer's company or government agents. So if we move on, so Lilburn's already involved in this business as early as 1640. One, and these are some of the people that were involved in the same kind of business at the same kind of time. Lilburn we've talked about, and his printer, uh, William Larner, but there was also the remarkable uh, Catherine Chidley. Um, Catherine Chidley was a, um, a sectary, a, a, a religious radical in a gathered church. A gathered church, the church was gathered outside the structure of the Church of England, and her son, Samuel Chidley, who becomes the Lerner's treasure. Catherine Chidley was a remarkable woman. She contested in print one of the great conservative religious uh, theorists of the day, a man called Thomas Edwards. Edwards was so stunned that uh, a woman had attacked him in print that he couldn't bring himself to reply for two years <laughs> <laughs> until she did it again, <laughs> and then he had to. Um, and signed pamphlets by a, 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 a contentious nature like this were incredibly rare. Catherine Chidley was one of the few women doing that. Richard Overton um, was a pamphleteer and an illegal printer. He had, if you can still go there now, um, up in Coleman Street in the city, in the alleys that mark Coleman Street round the Guild Hall. He was running an illegal printing, uh, printing press, and he was a, a, incredibly uh, um, acerbic and uh, humorous, uh, uh, humorous writer. He invented all these sort of caricatures of religious figures and did a series of uh, pamphlets called the Mar Priest Tracks or the Mar Prelate Tracks after uh, an Elizabethan figure who'd done the same, uh, the same thing. And they were so popular that some of them were turned into ballads and sung, uh, and sung in the street. Nicholas Tew was uh, one of the people he was running that printing press with in Coleman Street. Thomas Lamb was an early Baptist preacher who would hold debates about uh, religious questions uh, with Overton uh, just up where Spitalfields Market is beyond, uh, beyond Bishopsgate, which is one of the gates in uh, the city. Uh, William Walwyn, whose portrait is, uh, is here, of course we don't have portraits, we don't have images of all of the letters, of, of all the letters. there's no portrait of Lana, no portrait of, uh, of Richard Overton or Thomas Lamb, but there is a portrait of William Walwyn, possibly because he was uh, slightly older. I mean, we're talking about guys here mostly who are in their, uh, their 20s or uh, uh, apprentices. Uh, Warwick was older, richer. He was a member of the Merchant Adventurers, the biggest and most powerful of the city uh, of the city corporations. And unlike Overton or Lilburn, I mean, Il Lilburn's pamphlets are kind of, um, uh, they're like sort of Catherine wheels, a sort of prose. It just all sort of sparks off and flies. Uh, and flies everywhere. Uh, Walwyn is a very careful, logical, clear uh, uh, pamphlet, uh, pamphleteer. Um, and Henry Martin, the only MP to uh, be sympathetic to the, um, to the levellers, the only MP who was a Republican when the uh, Long Parliament first met in, uh, in 1640. This is Martin here, and that's the plaque on his house in Oxford where he was uh, born, still, uh, still there. Um, uh, as I say, he was uh, he was um, an outspoken Republican. In fact, he was uh, thrown out of the House of Commons in 1643 uh, for saying that we better um, that the king suffered um, than that the ordinary people uh, suffered. He was known as a, an incredibly funny man, and uh, and um, when the House of Lords was abolished, um, the the resolution in the House of Commons, which abolished the House of Lords, um, read that it was useless and dangerous. Martin got up and proposed that it was useless, but not really, 
that danger. Um, he was caught by one of his opponents um, catnapping on the benches of the commons. And uh, um, his opponent got up and said that the, the, the nodders should be put out of the house. In other words, people found sleeping in the house commons should be kicked out of the house. But Martin wasn't quite as asleep as he seemed to be. He got, got up and moved an amendment saying the noddies, the boars that put them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> The um, so those are some of the people that are at the centre of this if we move on a bit um, and in the first civil war essentially the division uh, on the parliamentarian side um, was between those who thought that the civil war was a kind of armed negotiation um, that it was all a, an absolutely uh, terrible accident it was bad for business it was uh, disruptive to trade, it was uh, dangerous for the country, and as soon as we could possibly force the king back from the negotiating table and reinstate the old constitutional arrangement of king, lords, and commons, the better uh, for uh, for everybody. And that view, um, uh, from the beginning of the Civil War um, in 1642, right the way through to the execution of the king in 1649, that view, the peace party view, is a mainstay, it's a permanent fixture one way or another in politics. Opposed to them are people in the war party. Uh, the war party, Henry Martin is one of their leaders, the levellers are definitely amongst the war party, who think that the king can't be trusted, that there's going to have to be a settling of accounts, a decisive defeat for the monarchy on the battlefield, and then we'll talk about what a settlement with the nation uh, might uh, might uh, look like. Uh, at first, of course, the the this, <coughs> at this stage, of course, there's already been a massive um, social, political, religious rebellion in Scotland, where the Church of England has been um, uh, well, Charles I tried to reimpose um, English norms on the Scottish Church, and this kicked off a rebellion because the Scottish Presbyterians defending the current form, the Presbyterian current form of worship, essentially um, defeated uh, the king in the, in, the early, in the early struggles. And um, in the middle of the Civil War, the Parliamentarians come to an agreement with the Scottish Presbyterians that they will invade England in support of the Parliamentary Court. And indeed, some 20,000 Scottish troops fight at the de decisive battle of Marston Moor. But the Presbyterians want to impose their particular view of how the church should be governed on the English church. And there are many people on the parliamentarian side, John Milton, um, the great poet uh, among them, who think that this is another form of religious orthodoxy being imposed on them. Uh, the new Presbyter is but the old priest writ large, was Milton's assessment, uh, uh, assessment of this, and of course, all the people we've talked about, John Lilburn, Catherine Tidley, uh, Thomas Lamb, they very definitely were independents who were worshipping gathered churches outside the Church of England, and for them, a reimposition of a national church which outlawed them was something which they uh, were absolutely set against. And so the battle then becomes a political and uh, religious battle between the independents, this included. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, who wanted either independence gathered, independent con congregations that couldn't be overruled by a national church, or gathered churches, sect so-called sectarian churches that were outside the structure altogether and simply under the control of their congregants. Um, um, uh, it, it, those people were on the other side of that divide. And that divide maps irregularly and with some difficulty, but also maps across to the war party and the peace party divide. People who, I mean, this didn't actually fit because some people who were Presbyterians in religion were in the war party, and some people who, well, very few people who were independent were in the peace party, but it, it's not an exact fit, but it became a, a political term that those who were in favor of a settlement with the king, who wanted to re-enthrone the king, um, were known as Presbyterians, and those who wanted to win the war and fight it to the end, and were also not in favour of the new Presbyterian church, were known as independents and sectaries. And Cromwell and Lilburn were as one at this stage of this. They were operating together in the 
Eastern Association, um, the country was broken up into various associations, raising military forces to fight the, the king, and Cromwell and Lilburn were operating together in the Eastern Association, uh, where Cromwell raised the first regiment of Ironsides, and they created what would become the core of the new model army. We can move on a bit from there. Um, <coughs> the trouble was that for Lilburn um, and for the Levellers generally, by the time the king has been defeated at Naseby and the first civil war is over, they aren't really much nearer getting a settlement that they like. There's still constant attempts to come to a deal uh, with the king and constant attempts to impose some kind of Presbyterian church settlement in England. And Lilburn, not for the first time and not for the last time, uh, finds himself locked up in the Tower of London. And therefore the sort of energy that drove forward the parliamentary side, the most radical sections of the parliamentary side, are now victims of a peace party majority in the Commons and a peace party majority in the, uh, in the Lords. So Lilburn is, uh, is um, jailed. And this is Richard Overton's uh, response, uh, the frontispiece of uh, one of the pamphlets that the Levellers produced, complaining, protesting um, uh, Lilburn's imprisonment. Now, this is, this is a brilliant piece of work, actually. It's brilliant for a number of reasons. First of all, um, it's, well, we're familiar with photo montage. This is engraver montage. Um, what Overton did was to take this, which we've seen before, the 1641 um, engraving by George Glover of Lilburn, and to engrave over the top of it the prison bars behind which uh, Lilburn is now being held in the Tower of London. But it's brilliant politically as well. Uh, because at the top here it says, the liberty of the freeborn Englishman conferred on him by the House of Lords in 1646. <laughs> now what many, many people, I mean probably thousands if not tens of thousands of, of readers of this pamphlet would have understood by this image, and which was laid out in the text, um, was this political message. You all remember freeborn John Lilburn the victim of the Star Chamber, the victim of the bishops, the victim of Charles I. You all remember him from 1641. Now look what's happened. We're supposed to have won a civil war against the king, but the people who we fought for have taken this same John Milburn and put him behind bars now again in 1646. Something is going wrong with the revolution if John Milburn is still behind bars. Now that was a incredibly powerful um, uh, message to be, to be putting forward, if we put forward a bit. Um, and when it came to the point where um, the army which won that civil war, the new model army, um, was such a threat uh, to the people who wanted a peace with the king, who wanted a settlement with the king, that they attempted to disband the army. They attempted to either send the regiments to fight in Ireland or to simply have them disbanded and often to disband them without back pay. And at this moment, this, that attempt by the Peace Party, by the Presbyterians to gain the upper hand, triggers a kind of revolution within the revolution. All the problems that Lilburn and the Levellers are facing then become focused around um, an army-wide mutiny in the new model army. Um, as Parliament sends its commissioners down to try and disband the regiments of the new model army, the regiments gather together and one after another, first in the cavalry, then in the infantry, they refuse to disband, they refuse to march to the ports to go to Ireland, and they begin to elect agents, or agitators in the uh, term, which meant representatives, um, in regiment after regiment after regiment. And these regiments now are under the control of the directly elected agitators of the army. So Thomas Rainsborough's regiment, Thomas Rainsborough, who we'll see at Putney Bay, Thomas Rainsborough's regiment is being sent south towards the coast, towards Portsmouth, to board a ship to go and retake the royalist stronghold of Jersey. Rainsborough isn't with them, their colonel isn't with them, 
and he's in Parliament. But halfway towards the same place, they decide they're not going to do this. So they turn around and start marching back towards Oxford, because that's where the New Modern Army's artillery train is, and they are terrified that the Royalists are going to sort of loyal people to the king are going to seize the artillery train. So they simply turn around and start marching uh, towards Oxford. Now, in actual fact, the garrison in Oxford itself is afraid of exactly the same thing, and it's already seized the artillery, uh, the artillery train. And then they decide that what they must also do is make sure that the king can't be taken to London and can't be in the hands of the moderates and the peace party. So Cornet Joyce, Cornet George Joyce, takes 500 troopers, goes to where the king is being held at Holmby House in the Midlands, and essentially takes the king into the, takes the king prisoner, essentially, takes him in uh, to the control of the army. And this is all done on the instruction, maybe with a wink from court, from Cromwell, nobody's quite sure, but certainly under the instructions and directors, directions of the agitators. And when the king says to Cornet Joyce, and this, I remember this is a cornet, this is the lowest conceivable rank in the army, in control of 500 mounted troopers. And when the king says, by what commission are you acting? In other words, on whose orders are you doing this? Joyce turns round and says, points at the troopers behind him. <laughs> and the king says, um, no, I mean, on whose orders are you doing this? And Joyce turns round again and says, by command of the troopers. And in the end, Charles de Bergen, well, you know, the choice to put the one, has to give up. He says, it's as fair a commission as I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and from that point on, the army have control of... Uh, of the king. We move on a bit. Try to get the copy there. Um, and that's and it's at this point that the Putney debates occur in this church. They're taken down by William Clark. William Clark is a is a clerk for the army. Uh, he takes them down in shorthand. Uh, the Puritans invented shorthand because um, you were supposed to pay attention to what was being said in church and then you were supposed to go away and think about the sermon afterwards and discuss it and debate it and do that shorthand notes were necessary so William Clark took the uh, debates that took place in the church between the levellers the high command of the army and the elected agitators from the, the new model army about the fate of the king and about the constitutional uh, settlement of the country we only know about it we only, we only got these records in the late 19th century between about 1660, when Clark gave the notes to his brother, and when the Restoration came, his brother thought it would be a very good idea to get rid of these notes and put them in Worcester College, uh, Oxford. From that moment until C.H. Forrest discovered them in the 1880s, 1890s, um, we didn't know these huge debates. We didn't have a record of them. Um, some of them still had some of the material, not these debates, but some of the material weren't even transcribed by Clark from his shorthand into longhand. So some of those had to be, because they weren't, it wasn't Pittman, it wasn't a standard shorthand, some of that had to be broken by Bletchley code, code breakers in order to retranslate them back into, into longhand. Okay, we're going to go on a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and this is the document that was produced at Putney and, discri and discussed in this church, uh, an agreement of the people. The first attempt at a written constitution ever in this country, the first attempt at at least manhood uh, uh, suffrage in this country, an attempt to break the constituents down into equal, uh, equal electoral areas, um, the first um, constitutionally settled um, a document which insisted on freedom of press and the freedom of political worship, proposed in this church by this man, John Wilder, uh, the leading level of spokesman in uh, Putney. Go on a little bit. The leading figure, spokesman for the levellers, Thomas Rainsborough, um, naval family, uh, buried down in Wapping uh, Churchyard. This is his uh, signature one of the images that we have of him, and his words at Putney, they're now engraved in the, in the balcony there, 
that the poorest tea that is in England hath a life to live as the richest tea. And that no man ought to put himself under a government that he hath not first had a hand in choosing is one of the first crystal clear statements of popular democratic mandate that we've heard. He was opposed at Putney um, by uh, Cromwell and by Cromwell's uh, son-in-law, Henry Arton, on the basis that this would lead to anarchy. <laughs> or, as Arton put it, all that I say, in other words, everything that I'm saying in opposition to you, all that I say is because I have an eye to property. If you give people democracy, they will use the democracy to take away property from the, uh, from the rich. Now, we know that it hasn't worked out quite that way, but they couldn't have foretold that in 1647. So if we move on a little bit. Um, that debate ended uh, with violence. Um, there was a proposed uh, rendezvous of the entire army in order to decide. The, the levellers won the debate at, uh, at Putney. Um, uh, Arton and Cromwell cut the debating short because they were losing the debate. And it was agreed by both sides that there would be a rendezvous of the army and that the ideas of the agreement with the people would be put to the entire army. Um, Cromwell and Arthur shortchanged the levellers. They called three separate rendezvous to make sure that the army wouldn't gather in one place. And at the first of them, Cromwell and other officers uh, rode into the troops, pulling the agreements of the people that they tucked into their hat bands, which had uh, England's freedom, soldiers' rights written on the outside of them, and put down the mutiny, shot. Well, they arrested three of the ringleaders um, and drew lots, uh, and uh, the two that won shot Richard Arnold, Private Richard Arnold, the one who lost. And from that moment on, if we move on a bit, that was a temporary end to it. The whole thing blew up again the following year because nothing had been settled, because the king uh, still had a, a moderate party that wanted him returned, and uh, a second civil war uh, was fought and was necessary to be fought in order to eradicate uh, the ability of the king to constantly pose a threat um, to, uh, to the revolution. In the Second Civil War, during this year, the levellers were at their height. In a meeting in Well Yard in Wapping, there's a description of Wildman and Milburn speaking about sending material to Kent and to other parts of the country. They're beginning to build a network, not just in London, but outside of London and throughout the army. They have two papers, the moderate, wasn't a moderate paper. <laughs> Joke that was made at the time. You can see in the archives there's a copy of the moderate from the day in which whichever person was reading this had put a little arrow here with the letters IM so that it could read <laughs> the immoderate <laughs> and then another little arrow here where they've written rogue. <laughs> the immoderate rogue. Um, which might have been a better title for a length of paper, I don't know, but anyway. Um, They've got that paper. They've got a paper called Mercurius Militaris, or the Army Scout, which is directed, written by John Harris, brilliantly written by John Harris, and um, directed at the rank and file of the New Model Army. And they produced the large petition uh, of uh, the 11th of September, 1648, which then triggers right across the country and in all the military garrisons, um, so-called parrot petitions, or copies of the petition, which demand a final settlement of the king which demands that there's impartial justice, i.e. that this person should not be treated any differently than any other person who committed uh, a, a crime. And it's that mobilisation uh, which forces the independence, forces Cromwell and Ireton uh, towards purging the moderates from Parliament, setting up the High Court of Justice, which tries and executes, uh, and executes the king. The moment, I guess, where it hinges... Rainsborough, Thomas Rainsborough is killed in one of the last engagements of the Civil War in, when he's laying siege to Pontefract Castle. Um, a band of cavaliers uh, let through the lines by a, a parliamentarian traitor, um, get into his, uh, in the inn where he's staying, and he's murdered in a sword fight in the, the street. His funeral in London becomes a huge leveller demonstration, and the sea green ribbon which was supposed to be the colour of Rainsborough's battle flag, is ripped up, worn on the arm in the hats of the levellers, and becomes the leveller uh, colour. I've gone on a bit in the air. Um, this is William Rainsborough, his brother's battle flag. So you can see there was a certain amount of animus towards the king. Um, 
Although, what's interesting about this is uh, not just the gory image of the beheading of the king, but <laughs> this Latin tag, Sans Populi Suprema Lex, um, the, the safety of the people is the highest law. And this really became the watchword for the parliamentarians in the execution of the king. It was no longer safe after two civil wars, uh, civil wars in, by, in which, by the way, uh, more people lost their lives proportionate to the population than in the First and Second World Wars combined in this country. It was no longer safe that this king uh, should rule. Um, there it is, the execution outside the banqueting house, the banqueting house as it still is uh, in, uh, in Whitehall on a raised uh, uh, platform uh, at the end of January 1649. Okay, one more. Um, the levellers were crushed after this. Um, they, they objected to the new regime because it was a, essentially a military republic. It was based on the power of the new model army and the agreement of the people had been cast aside and the levellers had imagined a republic, but a democratic republic of some, of some kind. This is their objection to it. And you can see from the title that um, Lilburn gives this pamphlet, England's new chains discovered. In other words, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And Lilburn was indeed put on trial uh, for his life. Um, the, there were mutinies in uh, Bishopsgate, in Burford, in Oxfordshire. Um, women petitioned for the freedom of the leveller leaders who were in the tower, um, but ultimately the levellers were crushed by that, re, uh, that reaction. Go on one more. Just to say, here's uh, women preaching like Catherine Chidley or writing like Catherine Chidley became an increasingly um, strong feature of the whole revolutionary mobilisation. Um, so strong that it gets mocked. This is a uh, this is mockery. This is a pamphlet produced especially to mock the involvement of women um, in, uh, in politics. A parliament of ladies uh, with their laws newly enacted. And you can imagine the thrilling discourse that exists in there. But this is the actual thing. This is uh, the petition of women to free John Lilburn, Mr. William Walwyn, Thomas Prince, and Richard Overton, prisoners in uh, the Tower. Um, when they petitioned the House of Commons, uh, the House of Commons, the MPs, came out to them and said, it's very odd. It's very odd to see women petitioning. And the women said, well, it's very odd that you cut off the head of the king, but no doubt <laughs> you're just <laughs> um, So uh, that mobilisation was very, very substantial in the army, popularly in London, if we move on, but it didn't work. Um, and that's when the leveller movement was essentially defeated. They'd been an essential part of the revolution that did happen, but they couldn't make... They weren't strong enough socially to make the revolution that they wanted to happen, happen. And so what we got was a republic, but a military, essentially a military republic that rested on the power of the army. This story is little enough told in this country. If you're in America, then the history of the American Revolution is a compulsory part of the school curriculum. If you're in France, the history of the French Revolution is a compulsory part from a very early age of the school <coughs> In this country, if you want to know about this at school, uh, well, there's one part of one option in the sixth form where you can study it. Um, not all examinations ignore it, though. The citizenship test in this country. Um, <laughs> there are more questions in the citizenship test about the 17th century than there are about either the First or the Second World War. And that's because um, if you're a foreigner and you want to come and live here, you need to know about our democratic traditions, but if you're born here, that's not really <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, last image. Uh, it's conveyed so. Um, I, uh, maybe later on we'll play this. This is uh, born John Reverend Hammer's song cycle um, about uh, the levellers. It's called this song is called Bonnie Besses in the Sea Green Dresses because women did indeed have dresses made in the leveller colours. But the day Bonnie Besses because I imagine. And this is from a pamphlet, the phrase is from a pamphlet at the time, because Lilburn was a Georgian. Um, the final image, this is one more way it's conveyed, my old friend Red Saunders. This is a uh, leveller women, a photo montage, again. Um, so homage perhaps to Overton uh, there. Um, this um, image looks like a painting, but in actual fact, uh, what Red Saunders does is to 
is to have people uh, um, in costume and then to take the picture exactly as you see it here. So by these means and various and many others, Lambda's Day and so forth and so on, this underground tradition of republicanism, of revolution, of revolutionary organisation, of freedom of speech and freedom of religion has made its way down to us as a real English tradition. To the Putnam debates, uh, with the, with what happened with the, uh, the Desert Parliament uh, near the end of the uh, Second mm. World War in, in, in Cairo? Mm. I was hoping there might be a message to say out of this, particularly in the context of the coronation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can you offer us any pointers? <laughs> 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 first question, I suppose yeah. one of the lessons is if you're going to go to war with the king, don't take ten years before you get to the execution. That's obviously <laughs> a, a, reasonable, a reasonable message. But um, I think the important thing here, really, is that this experience is part of our history. You know, th th this is the most important thing about it, really. You know, you're just about to go through war for the second time in two years. An enormous war of pro-monarchist, um, pro-establishment uh, proper propaganda. And that's odd, really. It's odd in the country that had the first revolution mm -hmm. that did this. And that, um, as Thomas Harrison, who was one of the regicides, one of the people who signed the King's Death Warrant, said, this was not a thing done in a corner. You know, mm -hmm. monarchs have been killed before, you know, by rivals, by members of their own family, in the battlefield but never like this, never by a public court erected for the principle of trying a monarch for treason. The whole idea that a monarch could be treasonous was a revolution. You know, previously, only subjects could be treasonous towards the monarch. The monarch couldn't be treasonous towards the subjects. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a you know, computational failure to try and imagine that. But the English Revolution established that on the broadest possible scale. You know, this is why John Milton, who became essentially Foreign Secretary uh, under the Republic, wrote the first and second defences of the people of England so that the entirety of Europe would know that this is what you did with tyrannical kings and you were right to do so. And that, re-establishing that tradition and the, the tradition of the popular mobilisation which made that possible I think is, uh, is what we're about today and should be about pretty much all the time, you know, in, especially at a time when the other side are busy trying to, you know, <laughs> erect a timeless link, which there isn't, of kings, queens, and so forth, down to Chucky the Third. Um, so, um, so there's that, um, and, you know, that's kind of part of the answer to, to Wazim's uh, kind of, This has become, you know, part of what sustains this is the left. You know, to be honest, if you imagine... Uh, a 20th century without a radical left and particularly without a Marxist left you would be left pretty thin on the ground yeah. with this kind of uh, this kind of history uh, to, be, uh, to be perfectly honest you know, Christopher Hill alone did an enormous amount of 
Cromwell himself um, said that if the Grand Remonstrance, the sort of list of Charles's crimes, hadn't passed Parliament, he would have emigrated uh, to the New World. And there was massive, there was a, a massive amount of those people who wanted to worship in gathered churches or in independent churches going to New England. There was a massive amount. John Pym, uh, the main parliamentary leader of the first part of the Long Parliament. Um, and many others were investors in the companies, the Massachusetts Bay Company and so forth and so on. Um, Rainsborough's family, his sisters, were married to John Winthrop, the first governor of Massachusetts. Practically every officer in uh, Rainsborough's regiment were returning New Englanders. Um, the main preacher for the New Model Army was Hugh Peter, who'd been in Salem in uh, New England. So, it was, a, it was an incubator and uh, educator of a whole cadre of radical Puritans who got out of England because of religious persecution, and once they see the war starting, they're back on their ship <laughs> and over and start uh, and over and start fighting. <laughs> how much Karl Marx actually knew about the Leavenworth, because he didn't have access to the Putney debate thing then. But he does say something like, when the army moved to Ireland, um, the Republic was crushed or thrown out of the window. So I guess that does kind of refer to the crushing of the Leavenworth in a way. And the other thing is, uh, related to that a bit, the Leavenworths, after they got sort of defeated there, and later disillusionment set in, can you say something about how far that demoralisation may have gone? Did they, in fact, become pro pro? Some of them become sort of pro royal, as has has been alleged. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's not a very well thought through question, but I mean, because of the moment we're in, um, you know, obviously uh, the restoration is the beginning of that story that leads up to the ridiculous coronation now. So it, the, the story where you've taken us up to ends with um, you know, the, the military dictatorship, essentially. But then the restoration comes, and I just wondered if you could say a bit a bit about that, because there's something about the restoration that have, we still haven't shook off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to... Um, John, if you could just say a little bit about sort of how long this period developed of people getting more radical, which, you know, I know if you look at the 1620s and 1630s, and um, particularly I was thinking with Milton, because Milton apparently was at the scene when Prynne had his ears cut off. You know, so you can imagine what this kind of does, I mean, apart from the immediate horror of it, but obviously it, it radicalises a whole sort of younger generation. He was a student at the time. And obviously, um, you know, he became very involved in the Republic and was very much in the face of the Republic. So, you know, what kind of different elements came together, to, you know, to lead to the radicalism that, that in turn led to the, led to the development of the Leavenworths? Yeah, so, um, so, um, Marx, Marx and Engels did know a bit about the Leavenworths. I mean, Ma and Marx describes the Leavenworths as the first Communist Party. Um, and obviously they didn't have the public debate and a lot of other material that's come to light since. Um, but they were aware of, of that. And it was very important. And despite not having the sort of depth of detail and whatnot, um, they did understand 
the position of the levelers in the in in the revolution and it's it, it's Engels who fleshes this out. He says, look, all all revolutions have to stretch to a point beyond which they can sustain it. In other words, in order to make the political breakthrough against the conservative forces, there has to be a degree of extremism which goes beyond what's socially sustainable with the social structure of the day. And obviously the levellers were part of that popular mobilisation that was driving the revolution beyond its kind of natural socio-economic sticking point. You know, to be honest, if, if you're a rationalist, and of course there's lots of historians who write like this, they, they, uh, I call the terror, they, uh, they're just making a mistake. Of Charles I is such an idiot. Why didn't he just settle for what was on offer in 1641 or 1642? Look, these guys would have done a deal. They would have had a moderated monarchy. We could have had the deal of 1660 or the deal of 1688. We could have had that deal in 1642. What is wrong with them? And what this leaves out is that social structures don't respond in sort of enlightenment, rationalistic ways. They have deep social roots. The Charles I was an absolutely convinced uh, absolutist, as was his father. Uh, everybody around him in the court is uh, thinking in the same way. There is absolutely no way, no way that this structure is going to suddenly say, oh, you're right, constitutional monarchy. Why didn't I think of it? You know, that's not going to be a, a result. And so you have to generate enough radical force to smash that before you can rebuild it. Uh, it's a, a constitutional monarchy. And that's the kind of, you know, as the Tom's, uh, Tom's thing. There's a very interesting thing where Marx and Engels are getting there in my mind, this, you know, because there's a lot of his, uh, there's a lot of commentary and a lot of, you know, popular journalism, which goes on and on about how backward Britain is. You know, it's got this aristocracy, it's got a House of Lords, it's got a, it's got a monarchy. It's so much more backward than the sort of French Republic or whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. Now, um, Marx and Engels make an interesting point about the English. They say the English bourgeoisie has a bourgeois bourgeoisie, bourgeois aristocracy, a bourgeois monarchy, <laughs> and if they could get their own way, they'd have a bourgeois working class as well. <laughs> and, and what they're saying is that the 17th century revolution came so early and was so complete that when they reassembled the social structure under the Restoration, and especially after 1688, they could suck into the bourgeois worldview entire chunks of other social classes. And so although exteriorly it looks as if this has been perpetuated from time immemorial, actually it was broken and reconstituted in ways which were wholly and completely compatible with modern capitalism. And I think that's a far stronger way of looking at what's happened in English history than the kind of endless sort of recitation of the fact that, you know, because of the House of Lords. I mean, I mean look at the House of Lords. I mean, who really thinks that this is a direct descendant of feudal landowners. <laughs> I mean, it's, all right, it's a corrupt bunch of packeteers, chances, and spears, but it's not. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go on, I'm sorry. No, it was just about about you know what were the preconditions that led. Yeah. So yeah. So the reason why it was such a big explosion like is because it had been a long time coming. Uh, I mean, you know, the crisis in the 1620s, there's been, which is, which is why Charles closed Parliament down and wouldn't call another one for 11 years, was an absolutely massive social crisis. There were rioting mariners in London, there were um, a huge wave of um, anti enclosure riots in, in, the, in the country. The Duke of Buckingham, the leading minister in the government, was assassinated. Uh, by an ex-soldier called John Felton, who then became a popular hero because he assassinated Buckingham. Um, and the attempt by Charles to close Parliament had been met by MPs who physically held the Speaker in his chair so that he couldn't dissolve uh, Parliament and were then banged up in the Tower for having done it. So there's a kind of, you know, for those of you who know your, the, your, your Russian history, there was a kind of 1905 revolution in the late 1620s, which is then suppressed and then becomes the 1917 of 1640-41, if all that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 
more of a comment, really. So it's, it's just to do with the sort of popular reaction to the execution of Charles I and then the reaction to um, the restoration of Charles II. There's, there's, a, there's been a tendency, really, among, among historians to sort of view the execution of Charles I as sort of, you know, done by a small group of people, a small group of individuals, and sort of widely condemned by the larger population. But largely, it's, it's an unsubs unsubstantiated claim in the sense that there's no evidence for, uh, for a sort of popular outpouring of, mon of monarchist support when Charles I was executed, and it's just been sort of view peddled by sort of revisionist historians mainly. And when we come to sort of the restoration of Charles II, there, there's plenty of evidence, um, especially when it comes to the sort of coronation of Charles II, of um, you know, a lot of sort of sedition and, and sort of elements of hostility to to Charles's um, accession as king, um, which obviously I think is sort of, yeah, we, we've got the coronation happening next week, so it could sort of fill us with some sort of um, historical parallel that there were, you know, there, there has been sort of evidence of sort of popular anti uh, uh, monarchist sort of hostility uh, even, you know, 350 years ago, and it wasn't just by a sort of small group of radical zealots, you know. Uh, this happened by ordinary men and women, and you can find these in sort of you know, plenty of sort of uh, court sessions and aside record depositions across the country, um, and some uh, really good historians have sort of uncovered that. A, a last round, so if you if you want to ask, you can raise your hand. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because um, yeah, Ch Ch Charles the first was. Not that it's terrible, it's still because the ruling class can't, can't rule, because Trotsky talked about this in the future of the Russian Revolution. Then you look at the, the French Revolution, and again, with Charles VI, it is 